thanks for the intro introduction and the kind words. Um, so first of all, if you have any questions during the talk, just raise your hands and wave, and I mean, I might see you against the glare, and I'll try to answer them on the fly. Other than that, I'm, of course, around. Uh, okay, so uh, don't worry. This talk is safe for work, uh, despite the corny title. And I know it's early in the morning, so let's go and look at the talk in three slides. And if you remember those three slides and nothing else, then okay, it's already mission accomplished. So effectively, what I'm going to tell you today is a story about how to scale machine learning by looking at three components. And then afterwards, I'll tell you how to make it really beautiful and all of that. So the first part is the parameter server. And this is basically, if you think about MapReduce, so you have the mappers and the reducers, and usually the mappers do their job first and the reducers do it second, and then after that, they are done. And all the state gets killed. This essentially is a persistent version of what you would do in MapReduce, where mappers and reducers can communicate, plus a lot of other details in it. You can also view it as a distributed key value store, and don't worry, I'll get into the detail. Um, now, unfortunately, all this fancy distributed machine learning is no good if your single machine code stinks. As in, if I can make my single ma machine code faster by a factor of 10 or 20, I need 10 or 20 times fewer machines overall, and that drastically reduces the difficulty in doing all the systems engineering, so you better do a good job for single machine. And I'll show you a little bit how to do that. And then finally, because everybody does this right now, the deep learning part, and I'll have a couple of really nice results, and you're probably wondering you know, how we compare to TensorFlow and so on. Stay tuned, this is towards the end of the talk. But basically what you get is you have the same hierarchy that you have between the parameter server and the clients, you now get between the machine that holds the GPUs and the GPU itself. So it's just you know a two-level tree. Right? And so this way, now your host machine that holds the GPUs acts as a first way of synchronizing state between machines and coordinating tasks. And then this is then synchronized against the rest. Okay. So technically, yes, Jeff Dean is right. This, there's no parameter server anymore. But in terms of actually how to build it, you still may want to actually have a parameter server. Okay. So let's start with something really, really, really simple. Namely, just logistic regression, right? So let's say I do a Google search for machine learning, and yes, uh, it looks like Google are actually trying to hire more people. So if you're doing machine learning and you want to work on ads, you can go and work with them. So this is essentially the problem they're trying to solve. I mean, it's a little bit more complicated than this, but in a nutshell, it's they want to find out what are the chances that you're going to click on this ad given that there is a query that was issued, namely machine learning, and maybe that the user is Alex, and maybe it's you know 9 a.m. in the morning. So you want to know, is the user going to click on it? And so they want to estimate some parameter w to give you this. Because what they effectively do is they will go and order the ads that show up based on the click probability and also depending on how much you bid. Right. So. Here's a very, very simple model. This one's been around for essentially ages and does the following thing. You assume that the clickiness of an ad is governed by some function f. And in the simplest case, it's just a linear function w dot x. So it's just a linear weighting of the coefficients. And then in order to turn this score f into a probability, you need to squash it. And a convenient way is to use the logistic function for it. So if you've never seen logistic regression before, it's basically just a way of mapping numbers going from minus infinity to, to infinity to a number between 0 and 1. Right. And this tells me, you know, is the user going to click? Now, of course, what I need to do is I need to find this, this function f. I can do this by finding some good parameter w to, well, find out what this function is. So I minimize how well I do on observed clicks, and then maybe I want to have a sparse model for advertising. I could also just have small weights, but sparse is the first non-trivial model that you might want to solve. And the tiny little problem is that you usually have lots of data, as in you might have a petabyte of data. And this is where a lot of existing packages start, well, having a little bit of pain. So 
Here's the simple al optimization algorithm. You can make it much more fancy, but in the simplest case, it works as follows. You basically take the gradient on maybe a subset of the data. You then apply this gradient in a gradient update step to your parameters, and then you shrink this back to zero. So this is actually called a proximal operator. And if you do a Google search on that, you'll see that several people by now have actually gotten tenure for essentially doing awesome work on this. So this is a big deal. But for simple L1, this is a very trivial, simple algorithm. Update, shrink, update, shrink. The nice thing is that all the parameters decompose by coordinates. So I can do all these shrinkage steps independently. And this is good because I can do it asynchronously in parallel. So, okay, let's get away from the math. Let's look at you know how this actually maps into stuff. So what I go do is I would go and compute a gradient on a subset of the data. Then each client sends the gradient from the client to the server asynchronously, because different machines will be slow at different times. At least if you are using cloud services, that's what happens. The server then does its thing in terms of updating its gradients, and then it pushes things back, or the clients can actually pull. So as you can see, the semantics are very, very similar to what you have in a distributed key value store. The only thing is that we overloaded what actually push and pull means. Okay? So the advantage is this is a really simple API. Can you do this at scale? Well, yes, on half a petabyte of data that fell off a truck somewhere in Asia, and I cannot tell you more about this. Um, it's basically 100 billion variables, 100 billion data points. Well, it took us under an hour. And uh, this worked a lot better than their deployed systems. So the red line is the parameter server. The other two lines were previously deployed systems there. Um, we didn't rest on our laurels. Um, Right now, we don't have quite such a lot, large data set available, but on Criteo, we've managed to now bump up the throughput from 140 megabytes per second per machine for learning to 220 megabytes per second. And these, this is an AWS machine, so they tend to be a little bit slower than the machines that we have before. So this is learning, not just a single iteration. So basically, if you have large data sets and you have a simple linear model, all is good. And this sort of kind of concludes the overview of you know, what you can actually do engineer with a parameter server. There are a lot of other things like sketching, logging systems, and so on. So there's a lot that you can do. But as said, all of this is worthless if you can't actually get your single machine to perform well. And let's again start with something very simple, namely recommender systems. I guess everybody's implemented a Netflix con competition recommender system at some point in their life. So what you do is, you basically would say something like, I have a user vector, I have a movie vector, maybe a user bias and a movie bias. And then the rating is going to be the inner product between user and movie bias, uh, movie vectors plus the appropriate biases. Note, I'm going through really simple primitive models here to convey the idea of the algorithm. In practice, of course, you should do a little bit fancier things. And let's just take a really simple least mean squares objective function. So basically just, you know, the square difference between what I estimate the score is and what the actual score is. And then, well, what you do is you can just simply optimize this. Um, one tiny little detail, you want to make sure that your parameters don't blow up, so you add a quadratic penalty to it, but you get the update equations in the middle two lines. Now, probably the people in the back rows can't really read the math. Don't worry. It's very, very simple. What it says is, Whenever I see a user movie pair, compute what I predict. Well, compute the prediction, look at the score that I get. Take the difference between the two, use this to weigh by how much I should update the user or the movie vector, respectively. So these are very, very simple vectorial updates. And then you just do an SGD over all random pairs. This is quite well known by now to actually work really well. And this ought to be a really cheap algorithm, right? Um, and then what you do is you go to Wikipedia and look at DDR3, DDR4 memory timing, and all of a sudden you realize, well, actually memory access isn't quite that trivial, right? And so 
let's just do a bit of a back of the envelope calculation. So take a small data set like Netflix. You know, it's 100 million rating pairs. Let's take something that's not exactly a toy example. So let's take 2048 dimensions just because, well, we can. Let's say we do 30 steps. And so if you just look at things like, you know, maybe about 60 gigabytes per second memory bandwidth and 100 nanoseconds for random reads, so every time you actually need to look up a new address, well, that's what you pay as a penalty, then it will cost you about maybe one hour, 20 minutes to run the algorithm. Our code takes one eighth of that time. So this is if you went to Rexis in Vienna, you would have seen this. And so the question is, how can we actually beat the memory interface, right? Because, you know, memory interface is kind of where you think, well, you know, this, you can't change the hardware. But actually, you can by being smart about the data. So it wouldn't work in general, but if you look at things like any recommender problem, you have power law distribution in the data. What this means is that most people don't care about most movies, and there are some users who rate a lot more than others. So now, if you're smart about memory access, then this actually works really well. Um, do you have a question? Um, I suppose there was not. Okay. Uh, okay. Um, so if you have a question, by all means, please raise a ha your hand, right? Um, but okay, so what you see on this picture is basically number of ratings as a f versus number of movies. And what you can see is, well, there are a very small number of movies that really command all the ratings. That's the green circle to the lower right. And then there's a lot of other random stuff. So what you can therefore do is, if you can just keep the parameters for those frequent movies in memory, or even better, in cache, then you don't need to pull it from memory again. And so all it comes down to now is that you find a nice balance between how you traverse through the data and how you pull things into your cache. And this is basically what gives us an order of magnitude. So the first thing is, it's quite trivial, you stratify by users. This is something that you would probably have anyway because you would probably already have aggregated all the user-specific data into one machine each. This way, you basically get rid of the cache, repeated cache misses for the users. The second thing is, you try to keep the frequent movies in the cache. The third thing, if you've never heard of false sharing, you should instantly Google that and find out what it means. It's basically if you have a multi-socket system and the data sits in the cache of the wrong processor. This is really poison because while this happens and the other processor requests it, it stops everything. Okay, this is bad, like really bad. So what happens is we then compare to the fastest open source implementation that we could find, and our solver has very, very small cache miss rates. So if you look at it, Level 3, it has 1.7% cache miss rates, and actually the algorithm runs at 85% of level 3 cache bandwidth. So it's pretty hard to beat that by now. Um, the other reason is simply the partitioning. So GraphG uses a checkerboard-like partitioning on graphs, which is kind of nice, but every time you move to the next block, you actually get, you basically trash your cache. That's not good. On top of that, this algorithm actually doesn't mix so fast, whereas what we do is we partition more like some Venetian blind. Um, so I'll show you in a moment First of all, the speeds, and then also why actually this partitioning makes this a lot faster. Okay, so the first picture is the speed. So the lower rate curve, and you probably can't distinguish the colors in the back, is us. And we also compared to a GPU code, and the GPU code ran on Netflix, and it was ran out of memory on Yahoo Music, so Bitmac didn't run on that. But basically, we're twice as fast, approximately, as the next fastest solver. Um, so GraphLab actually did a pretty good job at improving on top of GraphG, but yeah, we're still a bit faster. Um, now here's the, the part about the mixing that I alluded to before. So the red line is us, so this is runtime in terms of time, so we are much faster per epoch at iterating. But the other thing that you can see is that we converge much faster in terms of error. So the blue line is GraphG. And the reason why it converges much more slowly is because it actually takes it a much, much longer time to transfer learnings from a block of users to what I know about the movies and vice versa. 
So in other words, the algorithm mixes much more slowly. So this is why you actually don't want to do the graph tree partitioning directly. Okay. By the way, the code's all open source. You go to DMLC and you can download it. And you can get rid of your Hadoop cluster for recommender systems and replace it quite nicely with one machine. Okay. Um, now, of course, the problem is this is a primitive model, right? So, you know, inner products isn't quite enough. So we thought, well, can we do better? And actually, it turns out that there is this very nice paper by Stefan Rindley, who invented factorization machines. And without all going into all the details about mathematical niceties there, it basically uses a quadratic or cubic model rather than a linear model for recommendation. So this is a really awesome model for essentially doing nonlinear recommendations on sparse data. And if you look at the math, it's not so dissimilar to Vertovec and similar models. So if he'd called it a deep recommender system, I think he would have gotten twice the number of citations because it's really the same thing as Vertovec. Um, <clears throat> now, what it really does is it takes each feature, maps it into some representation space, and then it takes linear, quadratic, and cubic functions within that space. So that's pretty much all it is. Now the problem, as you can immediately see, is if you do that, let's say half a million features, so that's not a lot. Let's say I pick maybe 100 dimensions, which is not a lot either, right? And then I have, you know, eight byte representation. Okay, nobody does that, but let's just say. So now we're already, you know, close to a gigabyte. And you can very immediately see that this quadratic representation or cubic representation will eat too much memory for a single machine. So what you do again is, well, power law to the rescue. So most keys are infrequent. So we store everything on the parameter server. When we need it, we prefetch the data. So there's this wonderful paper called The Tailored Scale by Jeff Dean, and you should read it. It's super awesome, has lots of beautiful details in there on basically latency hiding. And yes, we use a few tricks from that book. So the point is, you don't necessarily need to request the data at the time when you process it, but you can prefetch. And this way you can hide all the latency. And you can batch up terms and so on. This gives you quite a bit more performance. Anyway, so you do mini batch optimization. You request a batch, you do the update, you push them back, and the parameter server does its updates and pushes things back again. So it's quite nice. Does it work? Yes. We use a couple of other tricks to keep the memory load low, and you can look them up in the paper. It's coming up in Wisdom for next year. Um, basically, by you know, being very, very efficient in terms of how you actually allocate parameters, you basically get no loss from that relative to the vanilla model, and it's a lot faster. And yeah, this is what everybody else would do if they were to use just linear models. Um, the Relative log is actually essentially money that you will be making. And, well, the x-axis here is essentially the dimensionality of the model. So adding more parameters will probably help your advertising model more. Um, does it work better? Um, yes, a little bit. So if you look at libfm, libfm actually dies on large models. Ours just keeps on working. And on single Worker performance, we're basically as fast as libfm, but we can actually run this multi-core, we can run it multi-machine, and so effectively what happens is that you get about an 80-fold speed up on 16 machines relative to libfm. So it's not too bad, you can basically now run large problems with it. Again, code's available, open source, you can download it today on DMLC. Okay, so now let's get into a few new results, so this is stuff that's basically, I may have talked about before. Let's talk a little bit about MXNet, and I really have to tip my hat to Muli in this case, because he's really to credit for the work there. So, um, essentially, the point is, well, there's a whole bunch of deep learning frameworks out there, and Torch, well, you know, it has like a MATLAB line tensor computation in Lua, or you can use Diano, or you can use CAFE, and you basically need to learn another programming language and 
stuff to just, you know, work with him. Now, what you could also do is you could simply say, well, hey, my toolkit should actually work in the my preferred language. So if you prefer C++, Python, R, Julia, then, well, you might want to be able to use that toolkit with it. And on top of that, you want to have multi-GPU training. And on top of that, you also want to have multi-machine training, right? And you want to do that without paying too much of a pain for that. Okay, so let me show you <clears throat> a little bit what the language looks like. So in Python, you just essentially, you know, essentially allocate the NumPy array, except that it does lots of interesting things behind the scenes. Um, what it actually does is whenever it then actually, when you issue a command, it inserts that into the uh, command, uh, in, into the dependency tree on the system on the engine, and this then executes things. So th this is why you can reasonably cleanly mix Python, or NumPy, for instance, which executes you know, in NumPy, and then the operations that you actually wanted to execute on you know, MXNet, it just inserts them into a task dependency tree. So this way you can reasonably cleanly mix the code. Of course, if your bottleneck becomes a single-threaded Python script, then okay, well, uh, we can't help you, but if it's not, then we can help you. So, to give you a bit of an idea, this is a bit under 60 lines of code, and this is AlexNet. So if you've seen the TensorFlow release just recently, you will see the syntax is very similar. And I don't know how you could actually define this network in a much more concise way. I mean, of course, you can't really see it, but maybe you can download the slides later. It basically just goes and says, well, here are the various layers of the network. Here are the number of units. Here's how they need to be connected. Then you just say, well, okay, I have four GPUs. I define that context. I tell the solver, use all the four GPUs, and then you go. So this is fairly concise. If you want to use Google Net, well, you end up with 100 lines, maybe 110 lines of code rather than 60. But it's fairly clean as well. So the Operations themselves are issued in, well, C++ engine in the back end, which then just sends tasks to the various GPUs. It's fairly effective in lazy memory allocation, and it can actually issue multiple threads onto the same GPU, and I'll tell you about some of the nasty side effects of that in a moment. Because this comes with certain risks, and you should be aware of them. But what really happens now is you have multiple machines, happily interacting by using the same idea of the parameter server and of the scheduler. And then within a single machine, well, you basically have your multiple GPUs. You can do that in the cloud. So this is how you can train, well, deep networks very, very cheaply on spot instances. I'm not sure whether Amazon likes us or hates us for it, but I think it's probably better than Bitcoin mining. Um, <laughs> And so here's what you get. So it's quite a bit faster than CXXNet. So this was on the Google Inception network. And the memory footprint is quite nice too. So the reason for squeezing the memory footprint is that basically you do a lot of operations in place. You basically aggressively garbage collect. And when parameters are to be shared, well, you do that. And that gives you maybe about 40%, 50% memory reduction. Um, can you do it on multiple machines? Yes, so here's a simple example. If we take G2 to X large, then basically at some point we just hammer the network, and unfortunately, Amazon's network, I hope they will, I'm waiting for the next release when they might improve it, who knows, but that would be great. Um, so the other thing is if you have four GPUs rather than one, okay, it goes four times as fast. Um, so just for kicks, we decided, okay, well, let's actually go and, uh, you know, take 12 instances, and they cost us less than maybe half a dollar per hour on spot instances. Mini batch size, 512. We did a bulk synchronous processing, so in other words, we assume that, you know, once each batch is done, and we allow for only a very small delay, just to keep conversions at bay and all of that, and you just run this. So G2 8x large, if you haven't seen this yet, these are the 
larger GPU instances with the four K20s in it. Um, here's actually a tiny little problem. The problem is that the, um, well, the 10 gigabit per second advertised bandwidth isn't really there. You get about two gigabits per second. Um, the reason for that is that while we are cheapskates, we're requesting spot instances, so they give you the stuff wherever. On top, and from the IP numbers, you can very clearly see if you squint at it that they're all over the place, which tells us they're really not in the same rack. Now, there are a couple of ways how you can actually fix this. So the first thing that you can do to fix it is you actually communicate less, or you communicate more concise messages, right? And all of those things help you quite a bit. So what you can basically do is you use randomized rounding. Now you might think, well, this is kind of crazy, but actually if you're doing dropout in a deep network, it's something not too dissimilar from randomized rounding, and you can actually get situations where the compression does not degrade, but actually slightly improve accuracy. So you, don't, you pay nothing for getting a lot of bandwidth savings. And so, okay, we get the you know, 37 fold speed up on 48 GPUs, that's not too shabby, and so we can train it in four hours on for 24 bucks. So you don't need a half a million dollars supercomputer anymore. Um, now, okay, I know this pictures have been reviewed, so one of the engineers took a picture of whatever and decided to find out what is this, right? Because you would, this is trained for, t for 10 hours on the GTX 980, and it nicely recognized that, of course, this is a bikini two-piece. Well, the politically correct answer. Um, the project went live about two months ago, and it's pretty popular, so you can check it out. Um, now, and there's a lot more pieces coming, a whole bunch of them open source, some of them may not be entirely open source. Um, so if you make some chips and you want MXNet to run on your chips, talk to us and we can arrange for something. Um, so there's a side effect. So this is actually what happened to us three days ago in Pittsburgh. And if you don't recognize it, this is basically uh, an, e an EMA connector and it's been burned up. This is in our server center. Okay, so here's what happened. We had a nice cluster, 10 machines, you know, dual GPU each. Um, we did burn-in tests before with a Bitcoin miner. Everything was fine, worked beautifully. Um, we ran some earlier versions and yeah, okay, everything was fine. And then the latest version of MXNet came along and all of a sudden this thing burns up. So what actually happened is that the power consumption went up sufficiently far because we just ended up using the GPUs more, they drew more power and they burned the cable. Um, so here's the kind of conversation you can't make up. Um, the other guys copied on it uh, have been removed for obvious reasons. So basically one of my students was running code, uh, so to Charles his name, and I thought, okay, his code was getting more efficient over time. And you actually will see that if you have students running deep networks, as you go along at some point the fuses will blow. We'd had that before. I thought, okay, we'd reach a new milestone there. Um, and so he goes and profusely apologizes. Oh, I'm terribly sorry, but actually as it turned out, Mu was running MXNet at the same time on the same machines and he was hardly seeing any slowdown from Zichao running Theano on the same machines. So in other words, if you have a Theano deployment, install MXNet on the side, Theano won't even notice it and you get extra capacity. Um, okay, at least until Theano starts optimizing the, uh, the efficiency a bit more. Um, okay, now, so here's a bit of a side-by-side -side comparison to TensorFlow. Well, it came out on Monday, so I apologize. The numbers are, yeah, still a little bit not so fresh. Um, but, so I think the big difference is you can pretty much pick any language you want in, Tensor, in MXNet. In TensorFlow, that's probably going to be a little bit harder to add other language bindings. Um, I don't know whether TensorFlow has a runtime engine just for serving. Well, we do. And we can do multi-machine, which I'm fairly sure somewhere in Google there exists some place where this also exists, but I'm fairly sure it's not released yet. So maybe if Google releases it, we can talk again. Now, here are the numbers everybody wants to know, and this is uh, 
Well, TensorFlow is not exactly very fast right now. Uh, so it takes 100, 940 milliseconds on Googlenet, and this was tested on our server with a GTX 980. And by the way, it grabs all the memory, and it runs out of memory for mini batches of size larger than 27 as of the patch of last night that they put in. Before that, it was 24. It still doesn't fix it. Um, we are much more frugal in terms of memory. Well, why do you care about it? Well, because a GTX 750 costs $120, a GTX 980 costs 400, and a Tesla costs 4,000 dollars upwards. So this is really mo real money that you're saving here. Um, yeah. So now one thing you would have probably noticed is there's a slight discrepancy between the numbers for um, MXNet on this table for Google Net and on this table. So basically overnight, uh, so this is why I was happily hacking in a few more numbers. So we did more extensive comparison. So this is GoogleNet, AlexNet, and VGG. In most cases, TensorFlow couldn't handle the large batch sizes, so we had to reduce it, and it's just a lot slower. Ours is essentially the same speed as the other solvers, but it's much smaller memory footprint. Um, so one important detail there is these numbers are maybe not perfectly favorable to MXNet because these are just single iteration numbers. Since we have an execution engine, this has a bit of overhead, and if you run it for longer, it'll actually run faster. So this way, if you look at real numbers, they look much better for MXNet. Okay, so I think I've convinced you that we can do fast. Now can we also do not stupid, right? So, okay, so you know, what's there to be done in deep learning, right? So the fully connected networks, I mean, this is like, you know, what CAFE is really good at, 70s, 80s. Yeah, that's basically state of the art then. Um, then convolutional networks, this is essentially Jan Le Cans Lunette, and then everybody else jumped on that bandwagon. And for 1D, essentially the Kalkin Brain et al. works from two years ago out of Oxford. This is essentially convolutions for images and text, works nicely. Then you have essentially latent variable auto regressive model. And of course, that doesn't sell, so if you call it long short-term memory, it does sell. So LSTMs is what everybody uses, or GRUs, or whatever else you call them. But yeah, that's essentially where things have been lately. But I think what's really exciting is, is models that have state or memory. So for instance, the attention model of Kyung Yun Cho et al., or the memory networks of Jason Weston, or the memory rewriting, so the neural Turing machine, I think this is where we're going to see a lot of progress. So we thought, okay, let's see what we can do with this. Um, this is results fresh of archive. So this is T. Chow having done this, the guy who sent the email before. So suppose you have stuff of this following form. So visual question answering, you know, I give you a picture, and while well, you get a question like, what's sitting in the basket on the bicycle, or what's the color of the, color of the box? Now, of course, um, the first thing you need to do is you need to actually figure out what the query is about, right? So you need to find that maybe there's a basket and a bicycle, right? You need to find out that maybe there's a box. So you basically need to find the frame of the box. Okay, so you do that. So now that you know sort of kind of the first stage of what you're looking for, you can reason on it, and you can then, you know, hone in on the relevant object. So in the first case, I mean, it finds, you know, just, you know, bicycle and basket, and in the second case, just finds box. Okay. So now it goes and focuses on, well, the thing on top of the basket, and it ignores the bicycle. In the second case, it, you know, focuses on the edge of the box, and that's it. And then you can answer the question. So this is stuff that we can do by now. Um, so how do you actually do, build this? Um, so I think one of the really neat ideas is the end-to-end -end memory networks paper coming out of Facebook. Um, so I mean, there's a lot of memory networks papers, but the end-to-end -end memory networks paper is the one with the cool math in it. Uh, the other ones have the same name. Um, so basically what you do is you have a knowledge representation. You go and weigh that based on the query. You then use the result of this 
to modify your query, basically to reason upon what you've seen so far, and you possibly repeatedly apply it to what you have. And then in the end you get the result. So they used that for sentences, and we basically thought, okay, let's do the same thing for images. So without going into a lot of detail, um, yeah. So we basically ingest the query using an LSTM. So this is this latent state autoregressive model by which you build up the state. You can also use a convolutional network, but LSTMs work just as well. And then we use, you know, standard image net feature extractor like VGG on the image itself, you know, get the features for the various patches. We then weigh them. So for instance, if you look at that, what's the man swinging at a ball on a tennis court, right? So you're not asking for the ball, you're ask, asking, you know, what is he using to swing this at? And so you first need to find out, you know, where the various bits and pieces are. So you then find that location, which in this case, if you look at it, it just looks like, you know, a bright blob in the, in the sea of darkness, and that bright blob pretty much coincides with where the racket is. Then afterwards you can say, well, okay, hey, now that I know what I need to be looking for, hey, it's a racket. Um, so this is freshly uploaded in our kit from last week. Um, does it work? Yes, we beat everybody else. So there are other results also in Dakar, Dakar Reduced, Coco Q&A, and well, basic image QA is probably the largest data set there. Are we still, so our numbers are basically the ones in the bottom, so the question is now, do you use convolutions or LSTMs and it's kind of a wash, but both of them work rather better than not having these attention models. We're still a far away from humans, right? Humans are really good at this. Uh, so let me show you a couple of examples of where this worked and then a couple of examples where it didn't work. So who's walking up that mountain? Um, how many people? Basically, I think it kind of guessed it. There's no way of arguing that it really counted to four. So this was something where we got lucky. Um, the next one I thought was pretty cool. You know, what's the color of the horns? You first actually need to sort of kind of find where the horns are, right? So it does that pretty well. And then, of course, you can now do the color question. So it's neat. Of course, there are cases where it fails. Like here, you know, how many um, umbrellas are there? Well, it basically failed at segmenting the umbrellas properly and counting them. So I think something needs to be done to engineer that. The last one, you could argue we probably got it right. Uh, you know, what's passing under the bridge? Well. I think most humans would say trains. I don't know why they insisted on cars because, yes, it's a train car, but a car, a car. <laughs> yeah, okay, so I think what I've probably given you at least a high level overview of is, well, there are some tools by which you can actually accelerate machine learning rather drastically. You can do that, you can do it at scale, you can do it at scale affordably in the cloud. You don't need to invest half a million or a million dollars for a big fat supercomputer cluster. And I hope that at some point Amazon will please upgrade their own GPUs and I hope that please at some point, uh, well, all the other companies will also make their GPUs available in the cloud. Yes, Microsoft and Google I'm talking to here. Um, so summing up, this is really the overall design. So you have basically the clients interacting with the server this is the overall systems design. There's a lot of details in there, vector clocks and consistency and all of that. Talk to me in the break about that. And of course, this couldn't have happened without the people who did a lot of the awesome work. And so I want to thank everybody who helped with that and uh, yeah, ask me any questions. Any questions? Oh, yes. <laughs> okay. Um, hmm. You don't have to compile. It's, well, Python, right? Or, I mean, if you compile C++, yeah, it's a C++ compiler, but you don't need to compile. So, compile times. 
Pardon? That's correct. Yes, so you could actually you could actually directly mess with the execution engine there, which could be interesting in some cases. But yes, um, <clears throat> you can use anything that Python throws at you and anything that you can construct this way. It also makes it rather nicely extendable. Yes? Okay, so if I were to ask it adversarial questions, I think it would probably suck big time, um, simply because it wasn't trained on it. Um, so having a good training set for that type of visual question answering would be really nice. So if you have a nice idea on how to gamify this to create more data, then I think we would see much, much better systems soon but the issue is going to be really how can we get the data in a way that we don't need to be, let's say, Google or Facebook to get the data, right? I mean, they can have it, right? This is easy. They throw money at it. Um, but if you can make it a game and everybody signs up, you can get it without money. And everybody's happy. So if you have a nice idea, please let me know. <laughs>